This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Thank you for tuning in to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, where we discuss everything there is to know in the world of sports. I am your host, Ben Brown. Alex is out of the studio today, so I am rolling solo on this Friday episode, as I will be every Friday, at least for the foreseeable future. Got a lot, a lot of content, a really, really busy day here at the podcast. We're going to be talking about college football week one, officially got kicked off last night. Well, really, we had a game last week with Cal and Hawaii, but we have the full slate of games starting up this weekend. Had some games last night, and we had a scare for one team with possible national championship admirations. Going to be breaking down that game, what I thought about it, as well as the top games of the weekend. We have a lot of great games, even going into Monday. We have a game on Labor Day, which is great. After that, I'm going to be moving in, talking about preseason week four, highlighting some of the games and some of the performances last night. Really, the last preseason game for the most part, a lot of stars don't play, but we did have some who did play in New England. The Browns played their starters for a little bit. Talking about preseason week four as a whole, as well as my preseason winners and losers in general. And then I'm going to end the show today talking about a little bit about what's trending. I realized Alex did it yesterday, but we have a lot of great things you know, we have people like Dale Earnhardt Jr., Yasiel Puig, among others. Also updating some great things. We have the U.S. Open currently going on in New York. The you know tennis championships. Got to keep updating you on that. So let's get started with the show. Going to be talking about college football week one. Last night we had, as I mentioned, a potential scare for a team with national championship admirations. That is the Tennessee Volunteers. They opened up their season last night playing Appalachian State. They come out on top 20-13 to 13 due Tennessee in that game, but they have to go to overtime to defeat Appalachian State. They were down 13-3 to three at one point in the third quarter. It did not look well for Tennessee at all. Appalachian State missed an extra point. They had a, a field goal that they should have made in the first half. So really, they kind of gave that game away a little bit. Even at the end of the game, it was tied 13 to 13. Appalachian State is driving in Tennessee territory. Terrible clock management by the Mountaineers. They left a timeout on the board, let the clock run out, avoided any chance of even possibly trying to pick up a game-winning field goal or, you know, anything even to get into consideration. Really not too well, but Tennessee do get out on top. So Josh Dobbs, really he's looked at as maybe even the best quarterback in the SEC along, in my opinion, with Chad Kelly from Ole Miss. But he played terrible last night. He was 16 of 29, 192 yards, one touchdown, one interception. And he didn't do anything on the ground, which is unusual, you see, from Tennessee and Dobbs. They like to run a spread offense. So he had nine carries for minus four yards. They win on a fumble recovery in the end zone. So Dobbs fumbles the ball in the end zone, gets picked up by his teammate. They go up set, They go up 20 to 13, go up by seven. And then they stopped Appalachian State in overtime to win the game. So here's here's my takeaway here. Here's what I look at this whole sort of aspect with Tennessee against Appalachian State. Every team in college football seems to always schedule at least one, maybe two non-conference games where they're against teams that are from like the double A, you know, teams that they should be able to beat, no question. Look at last night. You had number 19 Louisville against the Charlotte 49ers. This is not the San Francisco 49ers, the Charlotte 49ers. They end up winning that game 70-14. to Quarterback Lamar Jackson has six touchdowns through the air and two touchdowns on the ground. He did that all in the first half. He has eight touchdowns in the first half. Tennessee, on the other hand, goes in against Appalachian State, a team who nine years ago to the day last night, 
defeated Michigan in the big house. I think we all remember that game. You know, the blocked field goal at the end of the game to to seal it for the Mountaineers. Really ended Michigan's whole season. That next week out, they had lost to Oregon. You know, just a terrible season for Michigan. And it all started them losing against Appalachian State. Appalachian State is one of the best, you know, FBS, AA, whatever you want to call it, schools. They've, in the past, within the past decade, ran the table, won the national championship a couple of times. And now you look at teams kind of like North Dakota State. Think about Carson Wentz, just drafted number two overall in the NFL by the Philadelphia Eagles. He's from North Dakota State. They've been one of the top programs as well. If I'm going to schedule one or two of these you know, easy games to start my season out, I'm not even thinking about scheduling a team like Appalachian State or North Dakota State or any of these top you know, 1AA powerhouses. Here's why. I'm going to do just like Louisville did. I'm going to play a team that I know, hands down, I'm going to destroy. No, I'm calling up Sacramento State. I'm doing what Oregon's doing on Saturday. They're playing UC Davis. I'm doing that. You want to know why? Because if I lose this game, you can throw out any chance of winning a national championship out the window. By playing these weaker schools, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain. You're supposed to beat Appalachian State. You're supposed to beat them by 20. You're supposed to, if you're Louisville, you're supposed to beat Charlotte 70 to 14. If you lose, you're done. So I'm not taking any chances. I'm going to pick a team that I know I'm going to destroy. I'm not leaving it up to chance against a team like Appalachian State, like I mentioned, North Dakota State, because they have experience. They are they are always constantly one of the top programs in the AA division. They have experience, they have leaders, they have winners. They have, you know, that positive momentum. I think about the college basketball March Madness tournament. Every year you see a number 12 seed, a number 13 seed upset the 5 or the 4. And what are those schools like? They're teams that are in, you know, not big conferences, but maybe ran the table in their conference ran the table in their conference tournament, maybe had like five, six losses all year. So good teams with experienced players. You don't see the team that barely squeaked into their conference tournament and had to run the table to get into the tournament being the team upsetting these big powerhouses. It's always these teams that have experience and have leaders and that have that winning mindset. You know what I mean? So I'm doing exactly what Louisville did. Because if I lose, okay, Tennessee did end up winning. 20-13, to and they're ranked number 9. I'd be surprised if they are even still in the top 10 in next week's college poll because they barely escaped from this game. You know, they honestly should have lost this game. If Tennessee plays this way, they did last night against a team in the SEC, like LSU, Old Miss, Alabama, Florida. If they play that way, they're losing that game. And for Tennessee, a team that a lot of people had high expectations for, I realize it's just one game. So maybe they can sort of right the ship, turn it around. Maybe they overlooked Appalachian State. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. But if they can sort of turn it around, then maybe. But going off of last night, it doesn't really bode well for the Volunteers. You know, this was a team that might come out of the SEC and go into the college football playoff. But we'll have to wait and see on that. So Tennessee barely escapes. That's great for them. As far as some other games on the schedule, we have a few games tonight featuring number 12 Michigan State over Furman. We have number 23 Baylor over Northwestern State. Really the best game of the night, in my opinion, is number 8 Stanford, led by running back Christian McCaffrey, the Heisman hopeful. They are taking on Kansas State. So that's probably the best game of the night. And then as far as leading into the weekend, we have a number of great games I'm looking forward to led by number three, Oklahoma, and number 15, Houston. That game is in Houston in the NRG Stadium, which is where the Texans play. That should be a great game. We have a number of great games as well. LSU against Wisconsin. That game is at Lambeau Field. That's going to be great, you know. Wisconsin, definitely the home team, although it be at a neutral stadium. But in the home state, you definitely the crowd's going to be rocking there in Lambeau against LSU, ranked number five overall, led by running back Leonard Fournette. In my opinion, probably the best player in college football so that should be a good game we have number 18 Georgia against number 22 North Carolina 
We have the first game of Georgia's new head coach, Kirby Smart, coming over as a defensive coordinator from Alabama. Then we have number 20, USC, against Alabama, the aforementioned Alabama. Alabama always schedules a tough opponent week one. Last year, they played Wisconsin. So I give credit to Nick Saban and his staff, definitely not taking advantage of these lesser schools, although they are looking at some. You know, they are playing some. We have on their schedule, they have Western Kentucky and Chattanooga as a couple other games. So they are playing some weak schools, but they definitely don't do that week one. So that's definitely a good thing. I do like that. With the college football playoff, you have to kind of make a way and show to stand out, get those impressive wins. So I think that's a good thing. We have number two, Clemson against unranked Auburn. The game is in Auburn at Jordan-Hare Stadium. Definitely a tough place to play. Clemson, really, in my opinion, one of the best teams in college football, obviously led by quarterback Deshaun Watson. They will have hopes and admirations of returning to that college football playoff national championship game they did last year, although they did lose to Alabama. And then on Monday, really the night cap, the weekend cap, we have number 11 Ole Miss against number four Florida State. Florida State, really one of those teams everyone's talking a lot about, really experienced, really, really good, bringing back a lot of players from last year, led by running back Delvin Cook. You know, he almost surpassed 2,000 yards from scrimmage last year. The only thing with Florida State is they are going to be starting a freshman quarterback. Although, think about what they had with their last freshman quarterback was a guy named Jameis Winston. So, definitely not a bad, bad start for Florida State. A couple years ago, let's see if they can do it this year as well. So, with some of these games, as far as predictions go, I like LSU over Wisconsin. I will take Oklahoma over Houston. I think that game will be a shootout, though. I would not be surprised if we're looking at at least both teams scoring in the 30s. I will take Georgia over North Carolina. That game is in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta, so it is technically a neutral stadium, but they will have the advantage being in the home state. You know, So I think that benefits the Bulldogs. Definitely a team from the SEC that could be really good. I do like running back Nick Chubb. He reminds me a lot of Ray Rice on the football field. Similar builds, similar running styles. So I will take Georgia over North Carolina. I will take Alabama over USC. The game is at AT AT&T Stadium, which is where the Cowboys play in Texas. I will take Alabama to win that game. I think Alabama is definitely a better team than USC. As far as the number one team overall, I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. But I will take Alabama to beat USC. I think they're always prepared and always ready when it comes into the football season. I'll take Clemson over Auburn. I think that'll be a closer game than people expect. I think Auburn will give Clemson a run. But I do think Deshaun Watson being really one of the best players in college football, best quarterback by far, definitely a good leader. I think he will be able to handle Auburn, that noise, the environment, the crowd, and you know get it done. And then really the game on Monday, I'm kind of tossed and kind of torn as to who I think is going to come out on top with Old Miss and Florida State. Florida State is a four and a half point favorite. I mean, Old Miss did lose a lot of players. Think about Laquan Treadwell their top wide receiver, Laramie Tunsil, the top offensive lineman. They do bring back Chad Kelly, a quarterback who I I mentioned is probably one of the best in the SEC, in my opinion. But I'll take Florida State in a close game. I think Delvin Cook really carries them this game, and they sort of keep it easy with that freshman quarterback, find a way to win at the end. So I'll take Florida State. I'll take Clemson. I'll take Alabama. I'll take Georgia. I'll take LSU. And I will take Oklahoma. So no big upsets in my opinion in week one. But definitely a huge, huge week in college football. Starting it off right in my opinion. A lot of great matchups in the top 25 between ranked teams. Which is obviously a great thing. So we'll have to wait and see. We are going to be off on Monday because of Labor Day. So we will have to update you on Tuesday really. With all the top games and thoughts over the weekend. But with that being said, we are going to take our first break. Here at the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast. After the break, I will be discussing preseason week four, highlighting some of the scores and some of my takeaways from last night. We did have some interesting storylines, and then I'll be talking about my winners and losers of the preseason as well. So we'll be right back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
from news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. And welcome back into the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Brown. So last night we had every team with the exception of Washington Redskins and Tampa Bay Buccaneers in action. Obviously, that game moved up to Wednesday because of the tropical storms going on in the East Coast. So we had Kansas City Chiefs coming out on top of Green Bay 17-7. to We had the New York Giants coming out on top yet again of the New England Patriots. Seems like they always happen to beat the Patriots, although preseason doesn't really count. Still a win is a win. They came out on top 17-9. to We had the Philadelphia Eagles topping the New York Jets 14-6. to The Atlanta Falcons over the Jacksonville Jaguars 17-15. to The Tennessee Titans finish off an impressive preseason over the Miami Dolphins 21-10. to They won that game. Detroit shuts out the Buffalo Bills 31-0. to The Indianapolis Colts defeat the Cincinnati Bengals 13-10. to We have the Carolina Panthers ending their preseason with a victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers 18 to 6, the Baltimore Ravens defeat the New Orleans Saints 23 to 14, the Chicago Bears defeat the Cleveland Browns 21 to 7, the Minnesota Vikings defeat the Los Angeles Rams 27 to 25. The Battle of Texas, we have the Houston Texans over Dallas Cowboys. They won that game 28 to 17 did the Texans. The Arizona Cardinals defeat the world champion Denver Broncos 38 to 17. The Seattle Seahawks beat the Oakland Raiders 23-21. to And then the San Francisco 49ers defeated the San Diego Chargers 31-21 to to end preseason week four. So some of my takeaways, I'm going to start off here with the Minnesota Vikings and the Los Angeles Rams. As I mentioned, the Vikings did win that game 27-25. to A player who really, really struggled in this game was the number one overall pick at a Cal quarterback, Jared Goff, for the Rams. He was 6 of 16 for 67 yards. He did have one touchdown, but he threw an interception, and he also lost a fumble, so two turnovers. He really, really struggled in this game, really struggled the whole preseason, in my opinion. It looks as though he might even be a number three quarterback on the depth chart. For a guy that the the Rams traded a lot for to draft number one overall, to really struggle in this preseason, come out as maybe the number three quarterback on the depth chart, Definitely not the start that Goff was looking forward to in his NFL career, as well as the Rams not looking forward to the career that Goff has started off to. Although it'd be preseason, still, if you're not able to beat out people like Sean Mannion, I mean, that doesn't really bode well for you. You know what I mean? So, I don't don't really know. But as far as the Vikings go, obviously, I think they will wait until tomorrow's roster cuts to make a decision as far as quarterbacks. You know, people like Mark Sanchez could be cut, Colin Kaepernick possibly they did not play who it looks like is their starting quarterback as it stands right now in Sean Hill. He did not play. So those Joe Stave was 9 of 18 for 76 yards. And then Brad Sorensen was 4 of 9 for 53 yards and one touchdown. So I don't know. Minnesota, I think they're definitely going to play the waiting game as far as quarterbacks go. And then we'll sort of wait and see what happens from there. So as far as uh, some other games that really stuck out to me, obviously the 49ers, Colin Kaepernick making a lot of headlines within the past week about his stance on the national anthem and some of the socks he was wearing at practice within the, within the last couple of weeks. As far as on the field, though, he played pretty well. He was 11 of 18 for 103 yards. He did not throw any interceptions nor any touchdowns. He also added four carries for 38 yards on the ground. So as far as Kaepernick goes... There is some speculation as to whether he will be cut or not. The deadline is tomorrow. Regardless if the 49ers keep Colin Kaepernick or cut him, they do owe him about $12 million. So I think really they'll probably keep Kaepernick as maybe a backup. I do think it's Blaine Gabbert's job. So I think you can say Kaepernick, in my opinion, is a loser in the preseason because he was set up with a perfect opportunity Chip Kelly's offense, the spread offense, likes to do some option stuff, have a mobile quarterback. That's exactly what Kaepernick is. But with him being injured a lot of the preseason, not really playing too well with maybe the exception of last night, I think 
he is a loser in this preseason because he is not going to be starting for the 49ers in really the best opportunity possible. So I look at that as a loss for Kaepernick and for the the San Francisco 49ers. Although he did play pretty well last night, I do think he will stay on the roster as a backup. So next, I'm going to jump into the Denver Broncos. So Paxton Lynch played the entire game. He was 13 of 22 for 214 yards passing. He had two touchdowns, one interception. He also added 12 yards rushing on the ground. So definitely not a bad night for Paxton Lynch, the first rounder out of Memphis. Obviously, the Denver Broncos named Trevor Simeon, their starting quarterback, earlier in the week. So I think for Simeon, he is definitely a winner of the preseason. A job that looked like it will be Mark Sanchez's all summer long, leading into the fall, leading into the preseason and training camp. And I think Mark Sanchez is a loser of the preseason because he did not sort of put a stamp on that starting job and win that starting job completely. I think Mark Sanchez is definitely going to get cut by the Denver Broncos by tomorrow. If they cut him, they save about $4.5 million in salary, as well as a seventh-round pick from the Philadelphia Eagles. I realize a seventh-round pick is not much, but obviously you'd still rather have it than not have it at all. So I think Mark Sanchez is going to get cut. And then who knows, possibly he gets picked up by Minnesota or some other teams. I think he'll find a home somewhere. But I think I'll take Paxton Lynch as a winner this preseason. I thought he looked really good, looked really solid. He obviously has solidified his spot as maybe that number two quarterback behind Trevor Simeon. And I think that can maybe go well for him if Trevor Simeon struggles, if he's not looking too well, not looking too good at that starting job. Maybe they turn over to the rookie, Paxton Lynch. I do think that will happen eventually in the season. I'd say mid mid season, maybe week seven, eight, nine, ten. I think they turn to the rookie out of Memphis, Paxton Lynch. Really, he's going to be their franchise quarterback eventually anyway. So they might as well sort of see what he's got. I do expect that to happen, although if Trevor Simeon does play well and leads them the way obviously they're hoping, naming him the starting quarterback, then I think we'll see Paxton Lynch maybe next year, but we'll have to see what happens. So another takeaway I took from last night is the New England Patriots. They did not come out on top. They lost to the Giants 17-9, as I mentioned. But Tom Brady played the entire first half. Bill Belichick kind of gambling here with Brady. He didn't look too bad. He was 16 of 26 Threw for 166 yards, one touchdown, one interception. So not not too bad. But with Brady, they're kind of gambling on an injury here. But I think it's it was definitely a good, good idea. I don't know if I would have played him the whole first half. Maybe I would have played him just the first quarter. But he's not going to be playing for the next four weeks because he's suspended. Jimmy Garoppolo is their quarterback for the next four weeks. And Brady can't really do anything with the team. He can't throw a pass to any player on the active roster. He can't even be at the facilities, nothing. So he kind of has to work out on the side, work out at the gym on his own. So they want to get him as many reps as they can before he comes back in week five because obviously he will be the starter when he's finished his his suspension. So they played him the whole entire first half. Oh, Like I said, I would have done maybe the first quarter. I think you're maybe gambling a little too much with him playing the whole entire half. But Bill Belichick rolling the dice and Brady came out on top and came out fine with no injury. So I guess you can say it was okay. So as far as some of my other preseason winners and losers, I think the Tennessee Titans, in my opinion, are a definitely a winner of the preseason, especially their backfield of Derrick Henry and DeMarco Murray. Really that two-headed monster all season long, I could see wrecking havoc. Derrick Henry had a very good game last night as well against the Dolphins. He had seven carries for 62 yards and one touchdown. So I was surprised Derrick Henry really doing so well. I did not really like him out of Alabama I thought maybe the the speed of the game in the NFL would kind of slow him down. He's not really a fast guy. He's pretty powerful, but I thought, you know, linebackers in the NFL are just as powerful as Derrick Henry. So I thought he would kind of struggle. But if the preseason is anything to look forward to, Derrick Henry looks like a stud so far. He's playing really, really well. Him and DeMarco Murray together, forming that two-headed monster in the backfield of Tennessee. And then you throw Marcus Mariota in there, who can also run. I think they are a team who's maybe on on the rise, maybe a year or two away. But they do have a ton of draft picks when they traded their number one overall pick with the Rams. So maybe a year or two away, but I think they're definitely a winner in the preseason. Played quite well, and the running backs st- stood out, especially to me. So other, I'm going to say this is a winner and a loser. The Dallas Cowboys, obviously a loser in my opinion. You have your, your franchise quarterback, Tony Romo. He's going to be out about six, six, maybe eight weeks with that back injury. But you have Dak Prescott. The fourth round pick out of Mississippi State, the rookie. 
he came in and he was really the most impressive player in the preseason totally. He's going to be your week one starter, so you can really see what you have with Prescott, see if he's your guy for the future. So Dak Prescott is definitely a winner in my opinion. He solidified that backup job when Romo's healthy and obviously the starter going into the season. I'll have to see how he can do in the season. I mean, a preseason sort of is not... Not that it necessarily doesn't count because you have to be impressive. You have to play really well to even get to that position. But it's, you know, it's not the same as a regular season. You're not going to be seeing starting defenses all four quarters like you did. So I think Dak Prescott is a winner in my opinion. But the Cowboys are a loser because you still have that uncertainty. You can't really expect much out of Prescott. You can't expect him to tear up the world and, you know, be be exactly what Tony Romo was for the Cowboys for the last decade. I think... You know, obviously expectations are high, fans are hopeful, but you have to kind of wait and see. So Cowboys are a loser, and Dak Prescott is a winner for me. So I think that's going to conclude my preseason winners and losers. Some highlights, like I mentioned, I think that Dak Prescott is a winner. I think the Cowboys overall are a loser. Trevor Simeon and Paxton Lynch are winners. Mark Sanchez is definitely a loser of the preseason. And then I think Colin Kaepernick is definitely a loser of the preseason opportunity to start right away in a great offense that really fits his play style and he really couldn't you know take advantage of it and he has the injury concerns as well so not to mention everything he's doing kind of off the field or pre-game I should say so those are some of my winners and losers of the preseason I'm going to take my last commercial break here at the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast returning from the break going to do some U.S. Open tennis updates some games from yesterday as well as some games heading in to this afternoon and tonight and then I will finish the show with What's Trending, featuring athletes like Dale Earnhardt Jr., Yasiel Puig, and something a certain bar is doing related to Central Florida University. So we'll be right back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. And welcome back into the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast. Before we jump into what's trending, I'm going to be talking a little bit here about the U.S. Open. So we have some matchups here in the third round playing off between the women's and men's brackets. So we have Caroline Wozniacki coming off her second round upset of Svetlana Kuznetskova, the number nine overall seed in the tournament. She's playing against Monica Nicolescu in the third round. That will be teeing off, not necessarily teeing off, but sort of kicking off here within the next 20, 15, 20 minutes. Some other matchups, we have Angelique Kerber taking, off, taking on the American Catherine Bellis. That game is 9.30 Eastern time. Some other games that are really, really looking forward to. We have Serena Williams yet to play. She will be playing against Johanna Larson from Sweden. So really the number one overall seed, Serena Williams, looking to win the U.S. Open yet again. As far as on the men's side, we have the number nine overall seed from France, Joe Wilfred Sanga. He'll be playing the South African Kevin Anderson at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So in about 15 minutes from now, Novak Djokovic will be playing later at 3 Eastern, 12 Pacific time against Mikhail Yusni from I think that is Russia. Also, Ra- Rafael Nadal will be playing Andre Kuznetsov. That game is at f- four Pacific, seven Eastern time. And then we have Andy Murray, really maybe some people's favorites going into this tournament. He's playing really well, coming off of his Olympic gold medal in Rio and the Wimbledon Championship. He'll be playing the Italian Paolo Lorenzi later, as well as Kai Nishikori. He'll be playing Nicholas Mahout. He is from Japan, as is Nishor, Nish, Nishikori. Sorry, He's the number six overall seed from Japan. So that game will be taking on later in the third round. So the U.S. Open, you know, still in uh, sort of their preliminary stages, but will conclude next weekend, as well as NFL football. Going to be having to battle a lot of stuff. So, so we'll have to wait and see. But uh, we will always keep you updated here at the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast about the U.S. Open going on and some of the top games going on as well. So I'm going to move in now to what's trending 
We have a lot of great trending stories, as I mentioned sort of in teased in the last couple of segments. I'm going to start here with Dale Earnhardt Jr. So Dale Earnhardt Jr., probably the most popular NASCAR driver, you know, a lot of it because of his dad, Dale Earnhardt Sr., one of the most popular as well. So Dale Earnhardt Jr., he will miss the rest of the Sprint Cup season recovering from concussion symptoms. This was announced actually within the last hour. So he said, I wish I could return to the number 88 team this season, but, you know, to say I'm disappointed doesn't begin to describe how I feel, but I know this is the right thing for my long-term health and career. I'm 100% focused on my recovery, and I will continue to follow everything the doctors tell me. They're seeing good progress in my test results, and I'm feeling that progress physically. I plan to be healthy and ready to compete at Daytona, the Daytona 500, in February. I'm working towards that. The support from both inside and outside the race team has been overwhelming. Everyone has been so encouraging and positive, from my teammates and sponsors to my family, friends, and fans. It's motivating and humbling at the same time. So Hendrick Motorsports did say that Jeff Gordon, who is again driving for Earnhardt this weekend at Darlington, and Alex Bowman will continue to fill in for the remaining 12 races of the Sprint Cup schedule. So this is what owner Rick Hendrick Hendrick said in a statement. I know how hard Dale has worked and how frustrating this is for him. He wants to be back and we want him back, but but we want it to be for the long haul. We've had incredible support from everyone involved with the team, including all of our sponsors. They've put Dale's health first every step of the way. So obviously Dale Earnhardt Jr., I think, doing the right thing, you know, battling battling the concussions. Think about in a sport like NASCAR, you don't really think about how physically demanding that is, but just think of it this way. You're in that car for 400, 500, 600 miles, three, four hours at a time. You don't really have things like air conditioning. You're in these fire, you know, resistant suits, all this gear, helmets. You're having to really focus on the race, focus on everything your team is telling you, like, oh, you're clear on your left. You got a guy coming up on your right side, so don't go into the next lane. You know, really a physically demanding sport. These guys can't, like, hydrate themselves while they're in the pits or anything, in the pit stop. They kind of have to go three, four hours in all this hot, heavy gear, and kind of race and be really physical, it takes a toll on your body. And if you're having to deal with all that and deal with things like migraines or headaches, recovering from concussions, you know, exposure to lights, think about the day races and then the night races as well, all these lights, you know, beating down on the track, it's got to be hard on you. So if you're going to have to sort of do something like this and miss the rest of the season, have to recover for the next, you know, four or five months, it must be something pretty serious. So I think Dylan R. Jr., obviously not something he necessarily wants to do, but something he realizes, you know, I got to kind of do. I got to worry about my health. I got to really worry about the future. So it's unfortunate for Dale Earnhardt Jr., but, you know, with Jeff Gordon, really a legendary, soon-to-be Hall of Famer NASCAR driver, taking the wheel as well as Alex Bowman, they can sort of maybe learn a little bit. Bowman can from Alex, I'm sorry, from Jeff Gordon. So I think really that's definitely a good situation for Hendricks and for everything going on there at Hendrick Motorsports. So moving on, I'm going to be talking about Yasiel Puig. He's been making headlines all over the place. So an unknown team claimed him earlier in the week, had no intentions of trading for him, just really wanted to try and block any other team from picking him up. He got optioned down to AAA Oklahoma City Dodgers about a month ago. And Yasiel Puig, he is now set to return to the LA Dodgers. So Andy McCullough of the LA Times was the first one to break the news, which was also reported by Ken Gurick on MLB.com. This was last night, Thursday night. So the Dodgers sent the outfielder down to AAA at the start of August, as I mentioned, after he was really struggling in the season. But he's been doing quite well in AAA. He's hitting 348 with four home runs in 19 games for the OKC Dodgers. And it wasn't just about his play on the field that really sent him down to AAA. That bad attitude, you know, not really doing too well. And even when he went down to AAA, he wasn't doing too well. He posted all these videos on Snapchat of him partying and everything. But Puig, you know, he's he's really improved his attitude recently. He's playing a lot well. He seems to finally realize that this might be his last chance of being a successful baseball player. I think the Dodgers probably trade him in the offseason. They can work out a trade with any team there. But who knows? I mean, I'll have to wait and see the Dodgers really bringing him back up here for the last stretch of the season last month still in first place in the NL West over the San Francisco Giants but it's a small lead so maybe if Puig can sort of continue his hot start he had in AAA benefit to the Dodgers avoid being a distraction keep his mind right then maybe just maybe 
he can stay a part of the Dodgers and really help them towards the postseason. I really doubt that he'll be on the Dodgers next year, but as far as helping them here, definitely can be. You know, he's capable of still being a good player. He's young. He's only 25 years old. He's exciting on the base pads. He's got an incredible arm out there in left, in right field. So who knows? Maybe Yasiel Puig can sort of turn around and help the Dodgers here. So I got a couple more here. I'm going to be ending the show with talking some college football trending stories. So as I mentioned, Les Miles and the LSU Tigers will be going in to Lambeau Field tomorrow on Saturday to play Wisconsin. Les Miles has warned his players not to celebrate a certain way. So when you think about Lambeau Field, you think about the Green Bay Packers, what is a way they always celebrate? Well, you know, they score a touchdown, then they run over to the stands, and they do the patented Lambeau leap. You know, they jump into the crowd. Les Miles, definitely not a fan of that. He has told his players that they should better not do a Lambeau leap on Saturday. So during uh, during Wednesday's SEC coaches teleconference, this is per college football, Miles said that anyone who launches in the crowd will have to find his own way back to Baton Rouge. So he was quoted, I promise you that if anyone jumps for a Lambeau leap, they'll end up with their thumb out to see if they can get a ride home. It's college football and we'll play it that way. And I think our guys understand we'll do it right. So Les Miles definitely not taking any anything for granted, being really serious here with the Lambeau leap and the way they celebrate and everything. And I think, obviously, it's something that... You know, if you're a fan, if you're a member of the Packers, if you're a player, obviously they always do. I wouldn't be surprised if you see a Wisconsin guy score and do a Wisconsin Lambeau leap. That would not surprise me. But with LSU being kind of the road team, then you're taking a little bit of a risk by jumping up there, getting hurt. Obviously, the coaches warn you not to do it. So I think the players are going to obviously realize that and not do anything too stupid. Les Miles, a coach who's really well respected in the sport, a guy who has all of his players respect as well. A guy who is not going to take anything for granted, not going to be really silly, and not going to play around with these kids. So I think they'll obviously do that, but I think it was kind of funny. Like He's like, hey guys, you know, don't you do any Lambo leaps now, or else uh, you're going to have to walk home or something. So obviously I don't think that'll be the case. He's being kind of silly about it. But I think it's something his players will obviously respect his wishes and, and not do. So we are going to be ending our trending story here, as I mentioned, talking some UCF football and something that a certain bar is offering until UCF finds a way to win a game. So the University of Central Florida Knights went winless last season. They were 0-12 last year. After their fourth loss in 2015, an Orlando bar named The Basement promised to give out free beer on game days until UCF was able to scratch one win in the win column. Obviously, they went on to lose their last eight games, so... The basement was giving away quite a bit of beer, but they are doing the exact same thing this year. So they're going to be keep giving out free beer, the basement, until UCF win their first game. Think about how much beer you could be giving away. This is, you know, Orlando. You know, I mean, you got a lot of young people. Beer is obviously really popular. I mean, who knows how long this could go on. UCF is going to open its season hosting South Carolina State tomorrow at 7 eastern time for pacific so hopefully for the basement you know hopefully ucf can get a win you know they're probably losing a lot of money on giving away all this beer although it does bring people in if you're you know you're getting free beer obviously you're going to buy wings with it or you know french fries or a hamburger you know whatever but so you're getting people in but you know you gotta be losing money on giving away all this free beer so hopefully for the basement hopefully for ucf they can start off their season right they are playing south carolina state Obviously, a team I'd say they're definitely capable of winning against. We'll have to wait and see and always update you here as far as if the basement is still going to be giving away free beer next week. So that is going to conclude this episode of the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for listening. We have a huge action-packed week. As I mentioned, we will be gone on Monday for Labor Day, so we will have to update everything over the weekend on Tuesday. Again, I appreciate you for listening. I thought it was a great show. You can find all of our shows on a number of platforms, primarily on our website. It's gsmcpodcast.com. Make sure you click on the portfolio of podcasts. You can click on the sports one and find all of our episodes. This is episode number 53, so you can find the previous 52 episodes or really any other podcast you're interested in. A lot of sports-related ones, a lot of non-sports-related ones, a lot of things like entertainment, technology, 
movies, TV, weird news. There's there's a number of great ones. And then you can click on the Coming Soon tab as well and find all of the podcasts that will be launching sometime within the next you know, three to six months, hopefully the end of this year, early next year. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, really any sort of media playback on your phone, any sort of podcast app, we're there. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handles are at GSMC underscore sports. Our podcast network is also on Facebook and YouTube, the GSMC Podcast Network. And with that being said, I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you guys have a good three-day weekend. And I hope you are as excited as I am for the return of college football really starting up heavily this weekend. So I thank you guys and have a good day.